glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. And uh, if you feel like you're enclosed a little bit more, go back to our normal seating arrangement. And I figured if the if the state said you could do that in restaurants, we could do it here, right? So it also, as the temperature rises, you'll notice that unfortunately over on that side over there, they don't have the AC over there. But so you get the AC out in here, so that's that's a big deal. And so we're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Encourage you to come back this evening. This evening at six o'clock, we will have our Bible study this evening, and then also teens at six o'clock. So I encourage you to come, grab a hold of some other teens, and bring them along. And uh, we are glad that you are here to worship with us today. So I want to begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll start with our song service. So let's let's stand together as we look for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you today and we thank and praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace and mercy that you have extended to us in a way that's beyond our full comprehension, but we say thank you. Thank you for all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ. We pray this morning that you would be with those who are struggling physically, Lord. We ask that you would bring healing to their body. We pray for those that are hurting emotionally. May your Holy Spirit encourage them. We thank you for the encouragement that we receive from your word and the ministry of the Spirit in our life. We just pray this morning that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will and spiritual understanding. We thank you for all that you give us in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we got a birthday. And I think we've got one that just happened too. Did we just have Jordan's birthday? Come here, Jordan. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come right down here because they can't see you back there. Come here. Stand right up here. Come up here. Okay. We're going to say happy birthday to Jordan and have a
cups uh, that look like this on the back table. I encourage you to grab one of those as we are going to participate. Please remember when we do communion that it's not just for members, but it's for all who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. It's an opportunity to be able to celebrate all that Jesus Christ has done for us. And so that first song, as you think of that first song that we just went through, the fact that our God reigns, the fact that He died for us, the fact that He was buried and rose again and He lives. We don't serve a dead Savior, we serve a risen Savior. And so we want to celebrate that this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter. And my voice sounds a little bit rough it's because I don't know how, but I got one of those either allergies or those uh, you know colds that come on you that are just so great this time of year. So um, just uh, bear with me on that. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23, it reads, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, in the night which you was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're doing. He hasn't returned yet, so we're still doing it. We are still anticipating that, waiting for that, longing for that event to take place. And in the meantime, we want to be faithful in carrying out what he has commanded us to do. So if you take just the top piece of cellophane off, you will notice there's a little wafer. And that little wafer reminds us of the fact that Jesus Christ's body was broken for us. It reminds us of the fact that he gave himself for us. He had to take on human flesh in order to be able to do that for us. And that's why it's so important that he took on human flesh so that he could die for us. He needs all of it. If you take the next layer off, we're reminded of the fact that it is because of His blood that we have forgiveness of sins. We're reminded that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. It was necessary for Jesus Christ to shed His blood to pay the price for our sin. Drink ye all of it. We are reminded in the Word of God, it says they sung a hymn and went out. Well, we're going to stand together and sing a hymn, but we're not going to go out. Yet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, let's stand together and sing once again. And, uh, Bubba, would you grab one of these garbage cans for me? And Tom, grab this other one over here. <laughs> and you can just pass those cups to the outside and throw them in as we sing again. My Savior's love. Children can be dismissed for children's church.
on. Uh, <clears throat> encourage you to take the time uh, to read through First uh, John as we anticipate going through that uh, and do some verses in First John each week. Um, we're only going to do just the first four verses as we introduce some of the things in First John this morning, but we want to begin with looking that First John is a book, it is an epistle of no compromise or without compromise. Let's look at these first few verses in First John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. We want to talk about no compromise. As a matter of fact, as you go through the epistle, which I'm going to use that word several times, the word epistle simply means small book. I mean, it's, it's smaller than some of the other writings, smaller than John's other gospel that he writes. But as you look at it, you see that the word know or we know is absolutely crucial to understanding what he is confronting and what he's talking about. And we'll get into that in a moment. But over 30 times, the word we know or you know or that you may know is used in this little epistle of five chapters. As we look at 1 John, in a world where there may be many ideas of how one would be in relationship with God and have fellowship with the Creator and secure eternal life, John writes with authority and clarity, as only an apostle could, on how to secure all of that. There can be no deviation from the clear teaching of John. You cannot deviate from that or we're going to face error just as they did in John's day. They faced error in John's day. That's why he had to write it. So that as we look at it, it will help us as we go through this little book, it will help us to understand how we can know and have fellowship with and be in relationship with the God of all creation and how we can know for certain that we have eternal life. Important to understand that. As you look at why he writes it, what's his purpose, you can see it in just a few of the verses. In 1 John 1, 4, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. The idea is he wanted all of them, himself included, to make sure that their joy was mature or full. Even Jesus reminded us, and John writes back in the Gospel of John, he reminds us that Jesus said, I have come so that you might have life and have it to the full. That's why he came, so that we could really live. We would really understand how to have joy complete. And so John is doing that. See, both John's readers and John himself would have the joy that would be made complete as they understand the truth of what John is trying to communicate to him. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is writing so that we wouldn't live in habitual sin. There's a problem with that. If, if, if you claim to know and be in relationship with God and you are living in habitual sin, there's an issue with that. And so he is writing to help us to understand that. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 26, these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. He wants them to understand so that they wouldn't be led astray by false teaching. And in 1 John 5, 13, a verse that we use many times to help people to understand that eternal life is not a hope so, not maybe so, but you can know for certain. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. He wanted them to understand. You can know for certain that we have eternal life. And so as we look and we go through the book of 1 John, 
It's going to answer some of those things. It's going to help us to flesh out some of those things as John writes with clarity. See, there is a heretical teaching that he is trying to deal with. The heretical teaching that John is trying to deal with in his day is called Gnosticism. It wasn't new in his day. It had been going on for some time. As a matter of fact, it's a broad term that taught a mix of Western intellectualism, it's all about your thinking, and Eastern mysticism, and it is something that is very much like what we see even today in New Age philosophy and thinking. So it's not something that has changed. The idea of New Age, there's nothing new about it. It's just old Eastern mysticism and the Greek intellectual uh, superiority rewrapped in a different wrapping. That's all it is. It's really the same type of thing. See, it creeped into Judaism and and also into Christianity, and at its core, it taught that matter was impure, or that matter is evil. So this flesh, being matter, therefore, is what? Evil. The spirit is good. The intellectual is good. That's where the supremacy of knowledge comes in, because that which is good is superior to that which is impure. Now, that would have had great implications in their teaching because of Jesus Christ. Because it ran amok when it came to understanding that Jesus Christ had a physical body and he also was God, deity, manifest in that body. See, that is where John is going to confront what they're teaching because Gnosticism would have held that Jesus Christ did come. He he came as Jesus, as man, but he could not have been also the Christ. He could not have been the Messiah prophesied of the Old Testament because you could not have deity, you could not have purity within that human fleshly body. See, the Gnostics of John's day, they were concerned with the complexities of the incarnation. If matter was impure or evil, that posed a great problem for them. How could Christ and deity have become incarnate, have taken on flesh as a body, and be willing to be subject to suffering and pain? For them, they could not grasp that because of their philosophical ideas. Listen, what you believe... And the philosophy that you believe, your religion, is going to have a lot to do with how you live and what you do in life. I'll just give a simple illustration. Going along this same idea of Eastern mysticism, if you believe that in order to move towards deity, in order to move towards godhood, you are reincarnated, then if you are reincarnated, then you would not want to kill any animal because it might be in one of those stages of what? Reincarnation. It could be your aunt or uncle. Okay? Now, that's that's just how it is. Now, if you believe in that, And if you believe in that, neither will you kill the rats that are consuming over 25% of the grain in your country and leaving people starving. See, it affects everything. And John wants them to understand, no, you can't accept that teaching and ultimately have eternal life. It can't be done. This is critical. This isn't just simply a a, a, a maybe so. This is an absolute. See, they held that the Christian's body was a base prison in which the rational or spiritual part of human beings was incarcerated and from which it needed to be released by knowledge. So through meditation through incantations, 
through different ways. They would then seek to move towards that higher knowledge so that eventually, through process of time, they would be able to move towards godhood themselves. This is what John is trying to deal with. See, they therefore denied Jesus as Christ come in the flesh. They denied him as deity in the flesh. John asserts the reality of this. John wants them and us to know that Jesus is fully man and fully God in one body. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This side of heaven, we're never fully going to comprehend all of that. But we do know the Bible teaches it. And we're going to look at that this morning. It's important to understand that fellowship is a key word here in the, in the epistle of John. Fellowship is a key word. And as such, it's important to understand that fellowship is not harmony with God by what we think. They would say that salvation is not saving from sin, but salvation from ignorance. You just need to know more in order to be saved from yourself. Also, modern ethical salvation teaches we're not saved from sin, but from unkind, uncharitable thinking. That's what we need to be delivered from. The moralist understands that you would say that harmony with God is established by what we do. You need to, to do the works that are necessary to make it so you have eternal life possible for you. The legalist says we establish harmony with God by keeping the law. And there are all different groups within society that would be affected by those ideas and those ideas of thinking even today. So as you look at it, John wants us to know that fellowship with God is only by a regeneration in who we are. It's new birth. It's being born again. Those are the kind of words that the Bible uses for it. And it's being born again by the word of life. I like what Roy Lawrence says on this. He says, Fellowship is much more than companionship or comradeship. A lot of times that's what we think of. We just kind of hang out together, so therefore we're in fellowship. It means community of thought and interest. It means a state of unity and harmony. It implies that what was true in the Garden of Eden when man's experience with God was intimate and immediate. God walked with them in the cool of the day and talked with them and spent time with them. And they had that perfect fellowship before sin entered in. It's a mutual entering into of one another's experience. Now think of this when we're thinking of even fellowship within the body of believers. Because one of the things that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us is so that we can have fellowship not only with the Father and His Son, but also with one another. We'll see that. We're going to experience that as we go through 1 John. And one of the things that we talk about when we talk about to develop mature believers who glorify God as the purpose of the church is that we do outreach, we do worship, we do education and fellowship. But it's more than just getting together for coffee and tea. It is actually a sharing in community of thought and interest where we genuinely care for each other. And it's entering into one another's experience. This original state of man's relation to God is restored by the Christian experience. It's, it can be restored when we have been born again. When we have been regenerated. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. Tom Wells, a pastor and respected Christian author from his article, Some Pitfalls in Understanding First John, and I want to make sure it's clear on this, 
amplifies this warning to all evangelicals who would seek to accurately interpret and apply the important epistle of 1 John. The first letter of John has often been used to create a contrast between two kinds of Christians. Quite often, people will make statements like, it's a contrast between those who walk in the light and those who don't. It's a contrast between those who confess their sins and those who don't. Those who are worldly and those who are not. Those who abide in Christ and those who do not. Those who are overcomers and those who are not. John is not thinking different categories of Christians when he uses those divisions. It is very important to recognize this because the sustained contrast between Christians and non-Christians is the main theme. The main point of what John is getting to is not whether you have a spiritual Christian and a carnal Christian. Paul may deal with that in different ways, but that's not John's emphasis here. John's emphasis is strictly believer, non-believer. So if we misapply it, then we effectively pervert the teaching of the letter as a whole. Yet this has been done times without number. The distinction is between the believer and non-believer is a major distinction in John's eyes. So that as you walk your way through the epistle of John, it helps us to understand, am I really a child of the light? Am I really on my way to heaven? Do I really have eternal life? Or am I using thinking or some other thing to be able to bring me into that position? Important to understand that he is going to give us some tests. He is going to make some statements like, if you say. And he's going to go on to elaborate that. He's going to say, if you believe, if you know. See, those are the ways he's going to help to, to bring that out for us as we walk our way through. He's going to deal with false fellowship, false um, sanctification, false righteousness, false allegiance, false behavior, false spirituality, false speech. All of that he's going to deal with as he goes through. Don't miss this when reading 1 John. Don't try to put Here's a spiritual believer, and here's a non-spiritual believer. No, here's a believer, period, and here's an unbeliever. Keep that distinction as you read through it. That's why this epistle is the epistle of no compromise. How do we know for certainty of who Jesus Christ is and why he came? John gives us the answer in this epistle. It's a short book, but he's got a lot packed into it that we need to unfold. Just in these first couple of verses, let's just walk through a couple of things that he talks about just in these first couple of verses. First of all, number one, he talks about Jesus' eternality, the fact that he has existed forever. His existence didn't begin with the incarnation. He existed always as God the Son. So as you look at it, verse 1, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. First of all, you see his eternality. We'll break that down a little bit more in just a moment. You also John says, our historical observation of him. Not only me, but the rest of the apostles and those disciples who were there with him. That's why he uses the word we have heard. So you see the historical observation of him. They literally were able to observe who he was as opposed to the things that the Gnostics were trying to propose. And then also, third, and we won't get to this one this week, is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to it when we get into chapter 2 and also into chapter 3. So these were the things that were attesting to and were proven for the followers that this is Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh. First of all, the eternality. Notice that first phrase, what was from the beginning. The word was means 
he already existed. It was from, it existed before even that beginning moment. What was that beginning moment? That beginning moment was creation. Jesus' testimony of his eternality. When you go to the book of Revelation, you see the statements that Jesus makes to John in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, where he reminds, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He doesn't have a starting point. He is eternal. Important to understand that John is bringing that forward when he says what was from the beginning. So, Vine in his commentary on this adds that the idea is having been pre-existent, he, Jesus, became manifested. In other words, he existed prior to, but then he became manifested in the incarnation. That's how we understood and got to know him. Neither in the gospel nor in the epistle does he open with a phrase, that which came to be which would imply that Christ had a beginning. He did not come to be. He already was in existence. This is a statement that is combating one of the great errors of the Gnostics that he's dealing with in his day. Important to recognize that, that Jesus Christ is not simply an impersonal force nor a mere emanation from God. John Piper writes, This life is eternal. The life was made manifest. We proclaim to you the eternal life. This is the best commentary on the first phrase of John 1.1. That which was from the beginning. From the beginning means Christ our life was when creation began. He's eternal. He was already there in existence. He had no beginning. He'll have no ending. He is not part of creation. Don't miss this. Jesus is not part of creation. In the beginning, he is the source of creation, not part of it. All life comes from him. He is the spring, not part of the river. In the beginning was the word. And you can flip over with me to the Gospel of John, where John writes in John chapter 1 and verse 1. And we've preached on this many times. But in John chapter 1 and verse 1, he reminds us, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has ever come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The word life there, in Him was life, is life giver. He is the source of life. All life ultimately comes out of Him. So that when you look at the Word, we know that it's talking about Jesus Christ. When you go down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we know it's talking about Jesus Christ. And it is that Christ is the medium through who deity expresses himself to mankind. God has chosen to express himself in one of three ways. He has chosen to express himself in creation. Creation itself helps us to understand there is a God. Secondly, through the written word, he has chosen to express himself so that we have the written word of God that we can look at and read that communicates the truth of God to us. Then you have the ultimate the ultimate expression is in Jesus Christ. He is God manifest in the flesh. So you can understand and look at and see how God would act as he interacts with people. And as God in the flesh, he came and died for us so that we could spend forever with him, so that we could be in fellowship with him. So as you think through what he is doing here, John first of all says, let me deal with this first thing right up front. He is eternal. He has always existed. Okay? Then he goes on from there. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. He says, listen, we have observed it. We're eyewitnesses. We have looked at this, much like what Paul does when he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
And he wants us to understand that the very core of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the resurrection is real. As a matter of fact, there are all of these witnesses that you could have even gone and talked to in the day that Paul was writing and said, have you seen him? Yes, I saw him. Talked with him. Touched him. And that's what John is doing here. John is saying, we, we've heard him. We, we heard him speak. We saw him. And then he uses a term and he says, we looked at. In other words, this is not just simply, I glanced at him. You know, you could glance. I think I saw so-and-so at church today. Okay? No. If I'm looking and I say, I see you, and I, now I'm looking and understanding you are actually sitting right there. Okay? So I can say, my wife was sitting in the front row at church, and I looked at her so that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that's where she was. When they looked at... That means they studied carefully. They studied everything he did. They understood. Think of John. John was there on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw a glimpse of the glory of Jesus Christ. See, John says, we heard him. We saw him. We saw him on a regular basis, daily basis. But then we looked at intently. We wanted to make sure we were committing ourselves to the one who truly was the eternal Son of God. They were committing their whole life and they were willing to die for him because they looked intently into him and his life so that there was no mistake who he was. Also, we see that they touched with our hands. If he's just an emanation, if he's just a spirit being, you'd go, whoop, and then your hand would go right through him. Said, no, we touched him. We saw him. When Jesus Christ took on human flesh, he forever became the God-man. If you were in heaven today, where he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, if you were in heaven today, you would be able to walk up to him, talk to him, and touch him. So when we get to heaven, we get to hug our Savior. We get to see Him face to face. We get to thank Him and hold Him. And He can wrap His arms around us. He can say, I love you. I, I, I have loved you. I have waited to see you. See, friend, this is not just an emanation. This is not just theory. John is saying, I don't want you to miss this. This is fact. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've looked at it. I've touched it. Just like Thomas. I mean, most of us would be like Thomas, wouldn't we? Most of us would be like Thomas, where Thomas says, well, unless I see him, unless I put my finger in the hole in his side, you know, and it prints the nails, and I'm not going to believe. Next thing you know, Jesus shows up and says, what? Thomas, you go ahead and do this. What did Thomas do? He fell down before him and he said my lord and my god you know what jesus said blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe see how much more blessed are we because we are going on the personal testimony the eyewitness accounts of those who gave their life because they had committed themselves to the one that they knew was the Christ, that they knew was God manifest in the flesh. How powerful. And John is saying, don't listen to those false teachers for a moment. They don't know what they're talking about. We have seen it. We, have, we understand what has happened. See, we got to know the word of life, eternal life, Look at what the text says. The text says, our hands touch concerning the word of life. It is Jesus Christ who is the word of life. It emanates out of him. He is the source of life. In the beginning was the word. 
He is the word of life. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life. Why could he do that? Because he is life. He looked at Martha and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Because he is the source of life. It's not something, it comes out of him. He is all life. So when you think of it, you have eternal life. You can't have eternal life if you don't have the what? Word of life. If you don't have Jesus Christ as deity in the flesh, neither can you have eternal life. John is pointing them and helping them to understand it's absolutely critical that eternal life is more than a concept. Many times we think of, I can't wait to have eternal life. If you have accepted Jesus Christ's payment for your sin, and He is the one who is in your thoughts, in your life, you have eternal life. Why? Because you have Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Word of God tells us. So because of it, we have the word of life, eternal life, living within us. And if you don't have him, you don't have the word of life, and you do not have eternal life, no matter what else you would want to try to do. No matter how else you're going to try to approach it, you don't have it because you don't have the giver of life. You don't have the word of life. You don't have eternal life. And we're going to see more of that as we go through 1 John. He reminds us that this eternal life was with the Father and was manifested to us. In other words, as Jesus makes statement to the religious leaders of his day, he makes a statement and he says, Before Abraham was, I am. They knew right away that he just said he was God. As a matter of fact, they knew so much, they, they picked up stones to stone him. Why is it so many years later people are saying Jesus never claimed to be God? When the people of his day, who understood the language perfect, clearly understood that what he said was, I am God. See, when you look at this, you see that the Father, He was with the Father, and He was manifested to John and the followers that wanted to know Him. Well, there were a lot of them that wanted the benefit, but they didn't really want to know Him. As a matter of fact, when He challenged them about take up your cross daily and follow Me, many of them just kind of went the other way. So as we look, he says, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship and joy is only possible for those who have the word of life, eternal life. There is no fellowship between a believer and a non-believer on the level of fellowship like the Bible's talking about fellowship because we're reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 what fellowship does light have with darkness? It doesn't mean that we don't go out and try to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we don't go out and share the gospel. The reason we do that is so that they can move from darkness to what? To light. But the reality is, you cannot have genuine fellowship with and have that intimate involvement with and community of thought with someone who has no thoughts like your thoughts that are founded in the word of life. See, fellowship and joy, if you want fellowship with the Father, Jesus Christ, and other believers, and the accompanying joy that is full and overflowing, there can be no compromise 
on the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is fully God, fully man. This is not up for discussion or negotiation. This isn't to sit down and try to figure it out. John says, this is already settled. If you want fellowship with us, John says, if you want fellowship with me as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and if you want fellowship with God the Father, then you must believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. As a matter of fact, so strong is his point on this that when you go later on in his little epistles, you know, you've got 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Later on, he says, if anyone comes to you and he is not believing that Jesus is the Christ, then you're not even to bid him Godspeed. You don't even say, have a good day. You don't want him to have a good day. Okay? You want him, first of all, to turn to Jesus Christ. You want him to know who Jesus Christ is and whom to know is life eternal. It's not up for negotiation. As we bring this down, he says, as you think of this, Brian Bill makes a uh, simple but accurate summary of this profound introduction to the epistle of John. He simply says, Christianity is fact, not fiction. Christianity is proclaimed, not private. Christianity is shared, not selfish. Christianity is rejoicing, not repressive. That's what lives out. That's what comes out when we know who Jesus really is. When we understand He is the eternal Son of God, and that by believing in Him, we can have eternal life. John says, I write these things to you so that you can know that you have eternal life. Today, do you know that you have eternal life? Frankly, if John hadn't said anything else, these facts would have been enough upon which we could stake our present life and our eternal destiny. If John didn't write another thing in this epistle, if it was just these four verses, it would be enough to stake your life on it. Listen, we follow after and chase after stuff that isn't nearly as certain as what John has just brought forward. He wants us to know that you can have fellowship with the Father, with Christ, with other believers. You can know for certain that if you die today, you spend forever with God in heaven. What a tremendous, tremendous fact. Now, do you believe John's introductory affirmation. <laughs> See, if you don't believe John's introductory affirmation, then you cannot have hope of eternal life. He wanted his readers to not miss. You're either going to be a believer who accepts this truth, and you accept it because you know who Jesus is, and that I'm proclaiming it to you as an eyewitness, or if you reject it, then you have no hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you, Father, that there is no ambiguous uh, understanding of how do I get into a relationship with you? How do I have fellowship with you? <coughs> I thank you for the clarity that John presents the facts with. I pray, Father, that as we walk through this epistle, that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we would understand our relationship with you, that we would be able to help others even know and evaluate and look at their own relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you again for what you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you.